Good morning, Euroclosure. My name is Mohit. Uh, I'm here from India, and I get to start three minutes early. I, I don't know what the 10-minute break was about. Um, anyway, so I'm going to talk about uh, what lies beneath. It's a deep dive into Clojure's data structures. Um, I'm Mohit Thate on Twitter and Pasta Farai on GitHub and Slack. OK. So first, some motivation. When I come into work every day, what do I do? And what do most of us do, right? We, we set up our nice standing desks and MacBooks and screens and everything. And then we start coding away. And uh, when we're coding, what are we doing? We're writing features, then we're fixing bugs, then we're writing features, then we're fixing bugs. So we're essentially, at least I am essentially, working at a really high level of abstraction. I'm, I'm working at a business application level, right? So I'm sitting on this big tower of abstraction where I write programs that use maps. I, I depend on an interface. And then beneath that, there is an implementation. And beneath that, there is a platform and a machine. And it's turtles all the way down. So what I wanted to do today is uh, dig a little deeper and figure out how these things actually work. What's, what's the uh, magic that actually makes it work? So I came up with a quote. Any sufficiently advanced data structure is indistinguishable from magic, with apologies to Arthur Clarke. So the idea is that uh, I, I keep hearing about uh, the amazing immutable data structures in Clojure. There's uh, HAMTs and, and uh, bitmap vector tries and so forth. So how do they actually work? That's the idea. <clears throat> I'm sure all of you agree with this. Anyone who does not? OK. <laughs> but this also. So immutability is a good thing. Performance is necessary because we want to deploy our code in production. We, we want it to be fast. Um, these two things are in tension. You, you, you can have one or the other, but typically it's difficult to get both. So what I want us to do is to change perspective, to look at things from the other side. And by other side, I mean try to think of it as a data structure designer, as a language implementer. How would you tackle these problems? Uh, this picture is called Earthrise. It was taken by the astronauts uh, on Apollo 8 when they were orbiting the moon. So this is what the Earth looks like um, if you're sitting on the moon. <clears throat> so Chris Okasaki says that functional programming structure against destructive updates is like taking away a MasterChef's knives. And coming from him, that's a very valuable statement because he is the master chef, pretty much, in the world of functional data structures. So he's saying it's really difficult. <clears throat> Let's talk about the challenge. What does a data structure designer have to deal with? Right. So essentially, you are given an abstract data type. What is an abstract data type? An abstract data type is a name, so Q. And it's a bunch of operations and invariants. So given this. Your challenge as a data structure designer uh, is to come up with an implementation for this. Um, now, one thing I wanted to point out as an A side is that uh, most languages that we commonly use uh, make it really easy to, to give something a name and to give something an interface. But it's actually pretty hard to, to specify invariants in the language. Um, so I, I could say that any implementation of a queue must have these operations, but how do I assert in my language that it must be first in, first out, um, or last in, first out, depending on what it is? So I'm really excited to see uh, languages like Idris, which apparently let you do that in the type system. Anyway, that was an A side. So the challenge as a data structure designer is we want a correct implementation. We want an immutable implementation. And we want a performant implementation. And x marks the spot. So as a data structure designer, I have to do all these things in order to get it right. OK. Along comes Chris Okasaki. And he says, challenge accepted. So way back in 1996, uh, Okasaki basically was doing his PhD. And uh, he did a literature review. And he found that uh, a lot of algorithm and data structures textbooks, um, they say that you can use any language you want as long as it's imperative. Because all the pseudocode that you see has assignments and destructive updates. So he, he, he basically quotes Henry Ford and says that uh, Henry Ford once said that a customer can buy any Ford that he wants as long as it's black. 
<laughs> so Okasaki decided to change that, and he wrote his thesis about uh, functional data structures. And uh, this book is a really nice read. Um, some key ideas from there, um, structural sharing, bootstrapping, and uh, hybrid structures. So hybrid structures came a little later, but yeah. <clears throat> um, structural sharing is this idea that um, when you want to mutate a data structure, what do you do? So one very simple thing to do would be to copy the whole thing and make the mutation in the copy, but that would not be very space efficient. So what you do is um, you only copy the things that you need to copy, and you share structure with the original one. Okay, um, This is how it would look if you did uh, structural sharing for a linear structure. Um, <clears throat> for a tree structure, you get even more sharing, because essentially you only have to copy the path from the root down to the leaf that you're uh, modifying. Right, so as you can see in this, uh, in this picture, the entire left side of the tree uh, from C onwards is shared. So the more branching you have, the more sharing you have, essentially. And, and that makes for pretty efficient, um, persistent data structures. So as a data structure designer, again, life is all about sharing. The second idea is uh, structural decomposition. Um, so it's essentially saying that uh, you can build bigger and bigger data structures using uh, smaller components. So um, basically, if I already have a list data structure, can I build a map using that? Can I build a set using that? I can. And yeah, there are some other ideas there, but I'm going to skip those. Uh, the third is hybrid structures. So hybrid structures are essentially saying that let's take some properties from this data structure, some properties from this one, and make a better one that does something more. OK, so, so these are the key ideas. OK, so that's enough background. Let's dive in. What data structures uh, do we have in Clojure? So we have lists, which we use primarily for macros, uh, vectors for sequential random access, maps for structured data, and sets for sets. So uh, <laughs> what I'm going to focus on today is um, essentially vectors and maps. And the reason for this is that uh, lists are implemented as const cells, and that's a very basic concept uh, in, in pretty much every lisp out there. Um, and sets are literally maps of the key map to itself. So if we know how maps work, we know how sets work. <clears throat> I'm going to start with maps. Um, when I first got into Clojure, uh, map always brought up this picture in my head. Um, anyway, so what's the interface? So we have pretty much these basic operations. You get something out, you put something in, you remove something, and you can merge maps together, right? Um, what makes a good map? So typically, uh, the map implementations are really lookup focused, right? So how quickly can I find something in the map, right? So the idea is that um, you, you want constant time operations independent of the number of keys. So as your map grows larger, you don't want things to slow down. You want efficient space utilization, even with mutation. So you want to take advantage of structural sharing as much as possible. And in a dynamic language like Clojure, you want to support arbitrary objects as keys and arbitrary objects as values. So ideas, how do we go about implementing this? Now we are all data structure designers, and we have the ADT in front of us, and we have to do all of the things that are required. So how do we do it? OK, here's the simple idea. Let's just stick the key value pairs in an array, right? What that would look like is something like this. And then when I wanted to look up a key, I would just jump through the array until I found the key or not. Now this is a really simple idea to implement also. Uh, you can just do a copy on write, and, and it all works. But the time complexity is pretty terrible. As your array becomes large, your program is going to just die. Space efficiency, not so much, because as we saw, the amount of structural sharing possible with linear structures is not, not so much. Uh, can we use objects as keys? Yes. So how do we do better? Freeze to the rescue. Um, like the Lord of the Rings and everything else, trees always to the rescue. Uh, interesting aside, uh, since we're in Barcelona, since we're in Catalonia, 
Ramon Yui is a philosopher from the 13th century. He actually created this tree of science. So he actually categorized all the sciences into trees, and it's called the Arbol de Ciencia. Um, so I just wanted to say that I think humans have been thinking with trees, uh, categorization, and, and breaking things down since forever. It, it's the oldest idea in the book. So binary search trees, right? How do we, can we implement a map that is backed by a binary search tree? Yes, we can. So let's put key values at every node and uh, compare the key. If it's smaller, go down the left. If it's larger, go down the right. This is, a, again, a very basic idea. But binary search trees can degenerate into lists depending on the order of insertion. So if you put everything in sorted order, you're just going to degenerate down to a list again. And this is no different than the array that we saw before. So the worst case complexity would be order n. Space efficiency, possibly. If it's actually a tree, then we would be able to share stuff. But if it degenerates, then no. And objects as keys, yes. So the next question, how do we keep our trees balanced? Again, a topic of a lot of research over the years. We use balanced binary search trees. And there are a bunch of these. There's AVL trees, play trees, red black trees. Um, Closure actually uses red black trees. Always balanced, 100% money back guaranteed. Um, created by Gibas and Sedgwick in 1978. Um, they have some invariants. So an interesting piece of trivia here, um, the red and black colors are completely arbitrary. They could have been any two colors, but the printer only had red and black, so they chose red and black. And unfortunately, when it went to print, uh, the red didn't even show up, so. <laughs> uh, four invariants, every node is colored either red or black. Uh, the root is black. A red node cannot have a red child, and every path from root to an empty node must contain the same number of black nodes. Now, it's this third and fourth invariant that really give this tree a uh, balance, and there are some really beautiful mathematical proofs of this. Um, there's Professor Tim Roughgarden, uh, who's done a course on uh, Coursera. I believe he has an amazing explanation of why this tree actually balances itself. So um, I'd encourage you to go and look at that if you're interested. Okasaki, in his uh, book, uh, gives this piece of SML code, which looks like complete magic, but essentially it's the four cases uh, for rebalancing a tree if it does get unbalanced, right? So the idea of uh, a red-black tree being always balanced is that if you insert something um, and it breaks one of the invariants, then you must rearrange the tree so that it does not break the invariants anymore, and that's what gives you the balance. So I find this piece of code really beautiful because it corresponds very well to the geometry of the tree, um, but some might say it's completely unreadable. So a red-black tree makes for a pretty good map. Uh, you get uh, log n uh, search time, you get space efficiency because it's a balanced tree, so you're gonna get a lot of sharing, and you can use objects as keys. And closure sorted maps are actually backed by red-black trees. So if you actually use a sorted map constructor, you're gonna get a red-black tree implementing it. But there are still some constraints, uh, the primary one being that the keys must be comparable, and not all things are comparable. Um, secondly, keys are actually compared at every node, and this can be expensive. So when we do a big O notation, we often uh, say things like uh, equality comparison is constant time, but that's not necessarily true. If you have humongous objects, it might not be. So how do we do better? We use this idea. Try, the word try coming from retrieval, so is it pronounced try or tree, I don't know. Um, I'm just gonna call it try so that we know the difference between the two. So the idea here is that you do not compare the entire search term at every level. What you have instead is you have nodes and you have branches going out of that node for alphabets or symbols in your search term, right? So if I want to search for the word TAP in this try, what I'll do is at level zero, I'll take the first symbol. It matches an outgoing edge. So I'll go down to the next level. Then I'll take the second symbol. It matches an outgoing edge. Then I go to the next level. It matches. And finally, I find an end of word leaf node. So I know that the word TAP actually exists in this try. There are optimizations on this. There is a really nice paper called uh, The World's Fastest Scrabble Solving Program. 
they came up with a data structure called dog, directed acyclic word graph, uh, which was a compressed try, uh, pretty cool data structure. <clears throat> so essentially, it's a finite state machine, right? If you remember uh, uh, your discrete structures, that you have a set of symbols, you have a set of nodes, and you have a set of edges going out of the node, and you essentially have this function that tells you, I'm at a node, I'm looking at a symbol, where do I go next? That's, that's the real, real challenge in implementing a try. So let's go to implementations. How are tries actually implemented? The first idea here is lookup tables. You associate each symbol with an offset. So if you add A through Z, then A would be 0, Z would be 25. And then you just have lookups with uh, pre-allocated arrays. Okay, this image is uh, actually from Phil Bagwell's paper, um, Fast and Space Efficient Try Searches. Really nice read. Um, I highly recommend it. So if you're looking for the word A, D, D, add, what you do is you start with level zero. Since A has offset zero, you go to that node. That points you to the next level. Then D has offset three, so you go there. And then D has offset three, so you go there. And so you just go down levels until you find an end of word. And that's how it works. Clearly, we have a problem, though, that we need to pre-allocate these lookup tables for the length of the symbol table, right? So we need 26 pointers pre-allocated. So it's not a great map. Um, time complexity is actually really good, because the branching factor is equal to the length of the alphabet. So if you have 25 symbols, you have 25 possible branches. And so you're going to reach a leaf pretty quickly. Uh, but not space efficient and can't use objects as keys. So the next question is, how do we avoid null nodes? Here's an interesting idea. So here's the first hybrid structure. What if we combine the idea of a binary search tree and a try? Uh, it's called a ternary search tree, proposed by Bentley and Sedgwick in 98. So the idea is it looks something like this. You take the first symbol, and you go and search in a binary search tree, and that will send you down, if, if the symbol is there, it will actually send you down to the next level. If it's not there, you'll just reach a null node. And then you rinse and repeat. So by combining a binary search tree and a try, you get a pretty efficient structure, which is a ternary search tree. Time complexity, roughly log n again. Space efficiency, yes, because we eliminated the null nodes. Object says keys, um, not yet, because in that binary search tree, you, you're still using one symbol at a time. So, so we need to have a fixed alphabet set. So we improved on null nodes, but can we do better than log to the base two? Again, Phil Bagwell comes in and says, challenge accepted. So two papers here, uh, really cool. Uh, the first one is where he gives all this evolution of uh, how uh, tries came about. And the second one is called ideal hash trees. So the first idea is uh, the array mapped try. How do array mapped tries work? So array mapped tries say that we'll use bitmaps, bitmaps to the rescue as they are in so many data structures. Um, so use a bitmap to determine the presence or absence of a symbol. So let's say we had 16 symbols, 0 through 15, right? If you had a bitmap like this, and I've, I've made it go from right to left because that's how it is actually in closure. So in the fifth position, or in the index five, we have a one. That means that if you're looking at the fifth symbol or the sixth symbol in the alphabet, it actually is in the bitmap. If it's a zero, it's not in the bitmap, right? Fairly simple idea. So how do we actually answer this question in code? Does the symbol with offset six exist? We need to bitwise and this thing with a mask. What mask do I need to use? All zeros, except for the one which I care about. So if I bitwise and these two things, I'm going to get either a zero or a one. If it's a zero, there's nothing there. If it's a one, there's something there. Fair enough? How do I create the mask? I take one, and I shift it over by the offset, right? So this left shift operator just shifts things. So if I started with a one, one would be in the rightmost position, and then I just shifted it over to whatever position I wanted. I got a mask. I bitwise ended them. Then either I got a zero or a one. If I get a one, there's an array that lives alongside the bitmap, 
that only contains entries for the ones. It's not pre-allocated, okay? So now our next question is, where in this dynamic array should I look? So this is a really cool idea. It says just use the ones as tally marks. So if you're looking from right to left, the first tally mark is at the zeroth position. The second tally mark is at the first position, and so on. Something like this. Just think of going from right to left. And that's really the, the key idea in the array map try, right? So now we have to figure out how to go from this bitmap to an offset in that dynamic array, because we don't want to scan that array either. Again, the idea is, where is the entry for six? I know that six exists, and, and I, when I say six, I mean the offset six. I know that it exists because the bit is set, but where is it? So what you want to do is you want to count the tally marks to the right of the offset. So you want to count how many bits are set in that part, and then that gives you the offset in the dynamic array. Okay, everyone with me so far? So how do I create a mask to do this? Ideas? Okay, it's, it's really easy. You have zeros all the way till six, and then ones all the way after, right? So that's going to give you the, only the part that we are interested in, like this. Now, how do I come up with this number? It looks fairly arbitrary, but two's complement arithmetic to the rescue. So we had a number, right? We, we took one and we shifted it over six times. If you just subtract one from that, you're going to get this. So that's all you really need to do. You already had a mask. You just do mask minus one, and you get the second mask. And then you get another bitmap and all you have to do is count the number of set bits in this bitmap, right? So that gives us that pink circle and how many bits are set. That's going to be our offset into the dynamic array. How do we count set bits? Well, on most CPUs, it's actually uh, uh, primitive. Uh, Java gives us an implementation, an integer, which Phil Bagwell complains about, saying that they should just delegate to the architecture. It will make our maps go much faster. But this is what we do. So you do integer.bitcount and bitmap and mask. OK, what happens when I insert a new map entry? So let's say this green one, which wasn't there before, has now come in. What we're going to do is we're going to move things over and make space for it. So it's kind of like insert, insertion sort, if you remember that. But essentially, we have to maintain that invariant that the offset's position in the dynamic array is always going to be the number of tally marks to the right. So if I put a new uh, uh, set bit, then I have to ensure that it's going into the right place in the dynamic array. Okay, so this is a pretty decent map. The only thing that we're missing is that we don't support arbitrary objects as keys. Why? Because we need to know our uh, symbols beforehand, right? That's the size of our bitmap. So how do we fix that problem? Any ideas? This. So you take an arbitrary object. Do we have a way of converting an arbitrary object into an integer? We do. It's called hash eek. So you use a good hash function to generate an integer key from any object, right? Integers are on the JVM at least 32-bit uh, numbers. Then you divide the 32-bit integer into symbols. So you define your symbol table beforehand, and you say that it's going to be five-bit symbols, right? So you have symbols from 0 to 31. Think of it as I'm representing this number in base 32. If you remember your conversions from decimal to binary, or hexadecimal, this is base 32. This is what this number looks like in base 32. And now what I can do is I can take each uh, part of the number as a symbol and go walk down an array map try. Make sense? Now, this is interesting. If I have t bits per symbol, then I have two raised to t symbols, right? So if I have five bits, I have 32. If I have six bits, I have 64, and so on. 
So there's a, a lot of times this question asked that why are closures trees 32 wide? And Phil Bagwell actually answered that in one of his talks. Uh, this is a terrible screenshot uh, from YouTube. But um, it, it's actually a trade-off between, uh, between search and update. So as, as you basically make your trees wider, your search is going to become faster because you're going to have lesser levels, but your updates actually become slower. So basically, he just chose 32 because it's a nice trade-off between the two. So 32 white trees means uh, five bits. How do you actually compute the symbols? You compute them by shifting and masking, right? So if I want to find out what's my nth digit, right? So I'm starting from the right, so 0, 1, 2, 3. What I need to do is shift the thing over by 5 into n and mask with 1f. 1f is this special number with the least significant 5-bit set and everything else 0, right? So if I do a bitwise AND of anything with 1f, I'm always going to get the last 5 bits, right? Now if I want to get these bits, then what do I need to do? I need to shift by 10 and then do the AND, right? So this is the piece of code that does the magic. At each level of the HAMT, you have a shift parameter. So at the 0th level, you shift by 0. At the first level, you shift by 5. At the second level, you shift by 10. And you keep ending that with 1f. And you keep getting the symbol with which to do the lookups. Best comment ever, persistent hash map line number 19. Uh, Rich has these four lines. Uh, Rich is actually credited with the first persistent uh, rendition of the hash array map try. So this is how we did it. Uh, path copying for persistence, which just means structural sharing, which we saw already. Hash collision leaves versus extended hashing. This is when two things have the exact same hash value. What happens? You just put them in a node way down there, which is just an array map. Node polymorphism versus conditional. So no if else is instead we have uh, polymorphism inside the persistent hash map. No, well, we'll not go into the details of everything. The node polymorphism is interesting. So at the very top of the HAMT, you have these array nodes. Array nodes are just 32 wide arrays that send you straight down. There's no bitmaps or anything. So when your tree becomes big enough, you start off with array nodes. Then you go to the next level and the next level. Around the leaf levels, you get these bitmap index nodes, which is what we just saw with the bitmaps and the dynamic arrays, right? And then you have hash collision nodes for things that collide. So as an example, let's say I have a humongous map with one million keys and, and a million values, and I want to get something out of it. So what do I do? First, I convert that number into its base 32 representation, and then I just walk down the AMT, right? So at the level zero, I have 28 as my offset. So that's where I go, and I ask the array node, where should I go next? The array node could have an entry or not. If it does not have an entry, then the key does not exist. If it does have an entry, then it's going to send me down to the next node. So it's just a recursive uh, call. It, it just says uh, next node dot find with shift plus 5. So as you can see, our shift has now increased, and that lets us take the next digit, and that sends us to the next node, and that sends us to the next node and we finally find what we need to find. So this is a really good map. Great time complexity, like you have a billion keys, you can still reach the leaf in six hops. Great space efficiency and objects as keys also. Keys are actually only compared once, because you only compare the key when you reach that dynamic array where the key actually lives. Before that, it's those five-bit things that you're comparing. Bit juggling gives you great performance, right? Those are really constant time operations. And six hops to a leaf. Why not just use a regular hash table, right? So root resizing is one of the common problems. When you use a regular hash table, you need to pre-allocate the number of buckets, and then you do modulo that, and then if your number of keys increases too much, then you have to resize it and so forth. And it's not amenable to structural sharing. OK, I talked about searching for things, but what about updates? So updates essentially search for the thing, and then they clone the leaf node and the path to the root, exactly like the photo that I showed, or the, the picture that I showed in uh, structural sharing. So you just want to copy the path from the root down to the leaf. Everything else is shared. OK, let's talk about vectors. So the intuition is very similar. 
its array nodes all the way, the same array nodes that we saw in HAMT. You break the index into digits, and you walk down the different levels in the array node, right? So if this is my index, the only difference in vectors is that you start with a shift of 15. So, so you start with uh, how high your tree is, and then you reduce your shift. So it's instead of shift plus 5, it's shift minus 5. That's the only real difference. Otherwise, it's the same idea pretty much. So there's a function called array4, and you, that takes an index, and it just tells you that you're going to find your number in this array, and then you just go and find it there. Right? So it's a very similar idea. Um, there's one very neat optimization that uh, the root uh, holds a pointer to the tail of the vector, and this is why conj on a vector is really fast, because you, you can just go directly to the tail and insert something directly into it, and just clone the tail and the root, and you get a new vector. Right? <clears throat> So these are the structures that we already have in our language, but they are not perfect in all ways, right? So we want to use the right tools for the job. Hash maps, for example, don't merge efficiently. So if you want to do a lot of merging, consider using data int map, which uh, Zach Tellman has uh, published recently. It's, it's based on Okasaki's uh, work again and uh, some pretty cool performance numbers there uh, where you get an almost 10x improvement with uh, sorted entries. Of course, there is a constraint that your keys must be integers, uh, but if you do a lot of merging with integer keys, then this would be a really great choice. Vectors don't concat efficiently, and they do not subvec efficiently. So if you do subvec a lot, subvec is just a view on the original vector, so it's going to hold on to the head and it's going to hold on to the indices, right? So it doesn't let uh, the JVM garbage collect the original vector, and you could potentially have uh, memory issues. RRB vector is an interesting idea, again, based on Bagwell's work. Uh, Michal has an implementation, uh, core.rrb vector. Uh, benchmarks, I couldn't find, um, but yeah. So if you have a lot of vector catenation and sub-vector, so splicing, this is a really uh, good idea to look at. There is a really epic sounding data structure called c um, which Mikhail is going to talk about tomorrow at uh, 0850, so be there. I know I will, and I have no idea how this actually works, so I'm going to just skip that. <laughs> we stand on the shoulders of giants. There has been amazing research done in data structures since forever, right? The first paper on tries came out in 1959. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce a lot of European names here. So Brandeis and Fredkin. Fredkin came in 1960. Um, so Brandeis was trying to create a Fortran compiler with variable length words. The words were going on disk. Disk was really slow. Memory was really small. So what do you do? You create an index. So that was the first motivation for uh, a try. Um, then. It's actually not clear who came up with this idea of binary search trees. Wikipedia has four inventors there, so I've put all their names. In 62, we have Adelson, Velsky, and Landis coming up with AVL trees. So that was the first balanced binary tree. Then you have red-black trees, splay trees. 96, Okasaki writes his thesis on functional data structures, so you get functional variants of all those things. Um, we get turn research trees in 98, AMTs and HAMTs around 2000, and then Rich actually implements persistent HAMTs in, in 2007. So that's actually the first implementation of persistent HAMT. Um, now we have RRB vectors and uh, int maps also, so that's great. Here's the reading list in case uh, you are interested in um, looking at this further. So the papers that Bagwell uh, has written are actually really readable. Uh, which means that you have to read them about five times <laughs> instead of the average 10. <laughs> um, Okasaki's book is also really readable, the first three chapters, uh, like most good technical books. <laughs> um, the World's Fastest Scrabble Program, that's a nice paper. Um, and Brandeis has, oops, has a nice paper too. Uh, John Niklas has a really nice blog, uh, Polymathia, where he explains uh, how a lot of these data structures work uh, with really nice uh, pictures and so. Uh, I highly recommend 
reading that if you're interested in this topic. Questions, I'm going to deflect to the experts in the room. <laughs> but that's my talk. Thank you. <laughs>